Well, welcome to going it alone and dealing with the IRS by yourself. It's never a fun thing to do, but sometimes you pick and choose when you've got to do this based on how much money you've got. So if you're going to go it alone, what you need is a little bit of knowledge. I'm Barry Fowler. I'm the founder and I'm the president of Taxation Solutions. We have 27 offices across the country here to help the American taxpayer beat the IRS. As we go through this, it's going to be a little bit of our knowledge and the things that we know and we know how to do to deal with the IRS and how you can deal with the IRS yourselves. It's the knowledge we have gained over 20 years of fighting the IRS and beating the IRS within the tax laws that they give us to help the American taxpayer. So who are we talking about? Mostly we're talking about the people that we help, they owe $10,000 or more. And they want to go to the IRS and get, either get a settlement, payment plan, um, in some way beat the IRS to save themselves a bunch of money. So if you're looking to go it alone against the IRS, you, you've got to have some basic knowledge. The IRS offers a lot of plans. They'll offer your payment plans. They'll offer ways to settle your, your debt with an offer and compromise. Uh, but mostly what they want to do is collect every bit of dime that they can get from the American taxpayer, which is the people here. So, you know, you've got to come up with the knowledge to beat them at their own game. Uh, if you're still undecided about hiring a professional or to go into a loan with the IRS, our clients face this every day, every day. Because you call many of the companies out there and what you're calling for and what you're finding out is, hey, it's going to cost you thousands of dollars to do this. But what we do for our clients is we save them that a lot of that money and thousands of dollars every single day. But this is what you can do to help yourselves. So some of the critical common, uh, concepts we use to aggressively beat the IRS is what you're going to see here. And it's not a set of techniques that I can just sit here and tell you, hey, this is the perfect way of doing it. But it's the techniques that we have to use and modify in a case-by-case -case basis. So, you know, we evaluate every, every person's tax situation independently because no two tax situations are exactly the same. We can deal with a tech, retired tech, a teacher over here, deal with a truck driver, independent business owner, or even a large business owner. And each one of those are done differently. And one of the concepts that we use is financial repositioning. So you've got to be willing to work on your own taxes to help reposition yourself to get you the best solution. So as if you hired us, our duty is to advocate the best outcome on, on your behalf and to help you settle this. We're never going to allow anybody to go through and take improper deductions. We're not going to lie to the IRS for you and you should never lie to the IRS either. You gotta tell them the truth. But one of the reasons that you hire a professional and do it is we know how to avoid certain truths out there to help you get through that situation. But if they ask, you've gotta answer the question. So, what are you gonna focus on when you're dealing with the IRS? What you're gonna focus on is what we call the OIC, the Offer and Compromise. And that Offer and Compromise can be doubt of liability, doubt of collectability, or effective tra tax administration. What that last one means is just a way of getting people in compliance so that they can effectively get back on the tax rolls and pay their liability as they go. Your doubt to liability is do you really owe the money to the IRS? And there's ways we can fight that, whether you actually owe it or not, to get that effective tax administration that they're asking for as well. And doubt to collectability means you don't have the money to pay it. What you're going to see most Americans these days, when they owe a lot of money to the IRS, can't afford to pay what they actually owe. So when we see people calling us, they owe 10000 50000 100000 we've got people that uh, can't afford that. But the IRS says they can and that's where a lot of the financial repositioning comes in and what you're going to see here shortly. The other tactics we use is currently not collectible, meaning you just have absolutely almost no money coming in 
and you can't afford to pay anything. So you put yourself into a non-collectible status and they can let you stay there for a year, two years, three years or longer. If you're lucky, you might be able to get to stay there until the statute of limitations run out. And the third option, which is basically a full pay that you're going to see is a payment plan and payment plans can be very, fairly simple if you're under 25,000 because they, they'll do a payment plan. They'll set you up to pay the full amount, interest penalties and continue collecting interest from you for up to 60 months. So it does give you the, the time period to uh, pay that. If you owe under 50,000, a little bit tougher, but they'll still give you a little bit of time to pay that off. Still the same 60 months at the most. And if you owe over that, then you've got a little bit tougher hurdle to get over. That hurdle is going to be, you're going to have to do some, uh, what we call the 433As, 433Bs, to prove what you can pay to maybe lower your payment down. And so we're going to show a little bit more uh, on that. Now, some of the problems you're going to have with the offer and compromise that you see is the offer and compromise is going to stop, stop the statute of limitations, which means the 10 years statute of limitations is running on collecting your liability will stop as soon as you file that, which means they're going to have more time to collect that if they don't accept the offer and compromise. The other problem you have an offer and compromise if you're doing it yourself is sometimes you only get one shot at doing an offer and compromise and you exhaust that shot doing it yourself. Um, so make sure when you're doing it, it's the right offer. And that's what we're going to show a little bit more as we go through here and do it. But we want to make sure we, we address what could be the problems. The other problem you have in offering compromise, it doesn't matter who does the offering compromise with you, is you've got to stay in compliance for five full years from when they accept that offer and compromise. That means if you break the offer and compromise four years and 360 days into it, and you miss the deadline for one tax return right at the end, that full debt that you just did the offering compromise comes back in full force plus interest and penalties. So you got to always remember you got to stay in compliance for those five years from when it's accepted. And then you need to use this offering compromise very cautiously because you want to make sure it's done right and that you're going to stay in compliance. Now we use uh, doubt as liability here. It's a very aggressive approach, but it's sometimes it's, it's the way we need to go because you've been audited and you may not really have that liability. They may have filed some substitute for returns for you and you need to fight it as a possibility of a doubt to liability. Um, the easier one and the more efficient path we use is gonna be doubt to collectability. And that is because you can't afford to pay. And when you owe 10, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 or more, a lot of times there is a doubt whether they can actually collect it from you and if they can even get that collected over the next 10, uh, five years, 60 months. So you'll see that as we go. Now, our asset goals as we're going through this and it should be for you as well, is you know we're permitting the taxpayer to basically hold on to as much of their assets as they can possibly hold on to um, within the laws that the IRS provides us. It's not just the same as keeping the assets, but finding a way to hold on to those assets. And balance that impact of recommendations uh, against the liability and your cost benefit ratio. Okay. And what that basically means is what's the cost of holding onto that asset versus getting rid of it and helping get rid of your tax debt. Um, for you and then also what's their benefit the IRS is going to have out of taking that asset from you as well. And like we've talked about is uh, on the radio and ask the experts and everything else every case is different and whether you're handling it yourself or we're handling it this, when you're dealing with the IRS these cases can take anywhere from six months to two years to to solve. What you've got to be careful is you're not going to want to lead on the IRS agents to what you can do or can't do or even the time frames. 
when you're dealing with a revenue officer, you're dealing with somebody that's uh, working with the IRS trying to collect money, they're going to want things quick. And they're going to want it not just yesterday, but maybe two weeks ago. And they're going to short set you short deadlines. Try to make them as realistic as possible with the IRS so that um, when you're dealing with them, you can actually meet some deadlines. But that doesn't mean that because you need 60 days, the IRS is going to give you 60 days. It means they'll probably give you 30, and you better get it done. By all means possible. And even if you are getting it done in their time frames, remember that it's still going to take a long time for them to process. But if you're actually doing something like an OIC offer out there, um, you get that process. The revenue officer stops um, their collection activity because all collection activity will stop. And then that way you can have the time to get the rest of your finances in order and get everything else going and save yourself some time. But it's gonna take possibly up to two years. Right now we've seen a lot of them that we submitted um, a year ago just now coming back for questions. So you gotta be ready to face some questions. Uh, some of the forms that are gonna be required of you if you're taking on the IRS yourself, and the form, same forms we use and we have to go through and do, is the 433A, which is a financial statement. It's your personal financial statement. It's gonna be everything from what you own, how much money you got in the bank, retirement, houses, boats, you name it, it it's there. And it's all gonna be disclosed on the financial statement. If you own it, you better list it because the IRS does know, believe it or not. 433B, if you got a small business, then you're gonna file those 433Bs along with the 433A, which is the business personal financial statement or business financial statement. And the 433F, which is just a, a shorter form that the IRS will require, mainly a lot of times when you're doing the um, installment agreements and stuff. And last but not least is the form 656, which is the offer and compromise. It actually pulls the numbers off the 433A, 433B. They come down and actually give you an analysis of what the IRS is going to say that you owe. So be ready, for, be ready for those. Now, the collection information statements, which is the 433A, the personal financial statements, are going to have everything on there from all of your assets, the fair market value, condition, age what you put into repairs. Um, we're gonna be looking at some reduced values on those when we're doing the collection information statement or you are, and reduced by your current tax liability that may be created, and reduced by any encumbrances if you got loans and stuff on them as well. So you'll have all this in your 433As as we go. Now, one of the things that we're going to be, you're going to be looking to do, or we look to do all the time, is reduce assets. And what's the biggest asset the IRS is? First thing they're going to look for is that God Almighty cash you got sitting in the bank. If you don't find a way to reduce the amount of cash you have, the IRS is going to be right there to take it right out of your bank account. And just because you move, bank accounts, they may have levied or one of your bank accounts and so you move it from one bank to another bank, doesn't mean the IRS isn't going to find it because who's got control? Federal Reserve. So you want to make sure we find a way to reduce your cash. And that means, you know, maybe you need to do some home repairs, fix up your house. Um, maybe you have equity, you know, you have a house that has more, a higher mortgage than what the value may be, pay your mortgage down. Um, pay down your auto loans. So you're going to reduce that cash amount that you've got on hand. You may need new appliances, take it and spend it on new appliances. The more cash we get rid of, the less cash that's available to the IRS and you've got time, remember you may have that 60 days or 30 days to turn in some financial statements to the revenue officer before they start leaning or levying your account, or you may have gotten a letter that says, hey, we have a notice of intent to levy. That means you have 45 days before the IRS is going to go into your bank account. 
And if they don't do it on the 45th day, they'll do it within 60 days. It's almost guaranteed out there. So you're gonna find a way to reduce your cash. Pay down your credit cards, pay down your student loans, and then um, make sure you've got you know any loans you may have done with family or friends, that are, those are documented and stuff. And then even our fees if you choose to, to use us. So, you know, as you're going through this, we're also looking at how other ways we're going to reduce your assets. And, you know, you, you've got assets, right? You know, if you own a home, um, you know, the home has value in it. And so if you bought your home, let's say for $200,000, so you're going to have potentially some equity. Depends on what your value of your home is versus what your mortgage is. But that's the things that you've got to look at as you go through this. So, you know, you can, if you have no equity in your home, pay your mortgage down a little bit. And we're going to show you some, some things in these slides here that are going to show you some of the things that we do to help reduce what the value of your home is for the IRS. So this is what you got to watch out for. Um, you know, it's, it's another place to use your cash to get rid of it, paying down your mortgage and stuff. Um, if you move to the next. So one of the things that we're doing when we're looking at your home, if you're going to have an offer compromise or something that you're doing, even if you're doing a 433, just the A for the installment agreement, what we're going to do is look at the value of your home. And one of the big things is what's the quick sale value of your home? So we use uh, Zillow a lot to get what the value of a home is in a neighborhood and we'll take that value and we'll go in and do what the IRS calls us the quick sale value. And that is 80% of what the fair market value is. If the IRS really gets technical, you actually have to go out and hire an appraiser and get it appraised so that uh, um, you can come up with what the value is. The other thing that we show sometimes is the for sale value. And that for sale value is gonna be the quick sale value and then valued at 75%. So you can reduce the value as, as well. And then there's also a worksheet that the IRS uses, which is a minimum bid worksheet. And that's a form uh, 4585 that the IRS uses if they're gonna seize your home and then put it up on the United States Treasury's website. So if you ever wanna see whose homes have been seized across the country, the US Treasury has a website that has auctions every single week of homes, motorcycles, cars, businesses, property that they've seized and they have up for sale. Oh, I'm going ahead. Okay. The other thing that's going to reduce your value of your home if you're going through the offering compromise is the closing cost. So you're going to estimate a roughly $1,500 for legal and the wonderful real estate commissions. Hopefully I don't have any real estate agents here that I'm going to upset, but the 6% that they get for selling your home. So you can take a $200,000 home, the 80% less whatever mortgage you happen, happen to have on it, and then you get the equity for your uh, OIC. So in this case, we had a $200,000 home valued at 80% means it's 160, less a $90,000 mortgage, and our wonderful logo's in the way, but it'll leave you $70,000 of equity that the IRS says you can pay. So how about that? Um, but if we go to the next one, if you have a home, and we're gonna still estimate some of these, and we got a for sale example, their fair market value after the appraiser, inspector, and contractor says this is the work that needs to be done. We have 160,000, 75% for sale value. And then that's gonna give you what they're gonna say is the minimum bid of 96,000, less commissions and legal fees, less your mortgage, we show no equity. No equity in your house. And so the IRS doesn't have the $70,000 available to get from you to pay down your debt to the IRS. So this is one of the techniques that you can use to reduce the asset values, at least on your house.
Now, the other things that most, some people, I should say, do own are publicly traded investments uh, or even a closely held public corporation. So we're gonna use uh, some little techniques to get reasonable collection poten potential, whether it's a really a going concern out there. So a lot of times you're gonna have um, closely held companies that uh, you know, you're running and everything, but it really has no value to somebody else. And that's what we're gonna show. And that's what you can show is that there is no sale value of, of your company out there. And it upsets a lot of my business owners when I tell them this, but it's the techniques you gotta use to beat the IRS. And so that's what the purpose of this is to do. It's not to say, hey, you don't have equity in this or you can't do something with this. It's to say, hey, they can't collect anything from you on this. And we've used this quite a bit. You know, what's the marketability? And do you have ownership to where you have control? Because you may have partners in your business. So do you have control of your organization that you're working for? And then is there a corporate buyout? Meaning if you do have partners or something, can your partners buy you out? And if they can buy you out, what's the value they buy you out at? So we've, you've got to work through every one of these things with them to be able to show them that, hey, if you have a closely owned corporation, there's no value there. And even if they seize it, there's no value. And then if you go through bankruptcy, is there any asset value there? And that's all the things we've got to show the IRS or you've got to show the IRS that means your closely held corporation has no value. And like I said, we upset a lot of our clients because we'll tell them their company's worthless and they'll be like, what? Yes, it's worth a lot to you, but what our goal is is to show the IRS there is no value here. You can't take it from us, okay? And that's what we're trying to get through. And that's what you've got to believe in as you go through there. What else is available to the IRS? Cash value life insurance. If you have a life insurance policy that has cash value, that's available to the IRS as well. Um, you can borrow that value and again, find a place to spend it. So if you're doing planning and you're doing asset planning to save yourself money in the IRS, there's another place where we can take that money, borrow against it, spend it to fix your house, put new appliances in, put a new deck in, whatever you want to do. Um, you can surrender your, your policy if you need to and apply that cash to the IRS. So a lot of times we don't want to do that. We want to find other techniques beyond that. Or convert it to a paid up term policy. And that's a nice trick to use because the IRS doesn't allow life insurance to be deducted. So if you're paying for life insurance so you can convert to a paid up term, that's great. And then you, what's your insurability? So if you have no insurability, then we've got to work with the IRS to make sure that, hey, there's a reason for this life insurance. Small kids, you're not insurable, health risks, whatever. You're not gonna be able to get life insurance again. We might be able to convince the IRS to hey, you can keep that policy. And then is it reasonable? And that's always a good test is reasonableness. You have a reasonable amount of life insurance as you go out there. What else is available to the IRS? Retirement accounts. A lot of people that we deal with go, oh my gosh, what do you mean retirement accounts are available to the IRS? Well, a retirement account is cash. It just means you didn't pay tax on it. If it's in a regular A or a regular 401k, there's no tax paid on it. You, they can take that money. It doesn't matter. And then you still pay the tax and penalties on it because they took it. So, you know, there's little strategies that we can use to avoid some of that. And it may be bankruptcy. It could be rolling it over to a different plan. Um, and dealing with the IRS that way so that, you know, we can reduce those assets and what's going to be available to, to the IRS. Again, we're talking 401ks, uh, pension plans. One of the things with the pension plans that we've got is depends on how old you are and what your um, ability to earn money in retirement. So not just Social Security, but your pension. Um, and so we're gonna make sure that we don't double count that into what your collection potential is for the IRS. 
And then we've got other miscellaneous assets. Um, a lot of times you have a spouse who's not liable. So you may have been filing separate or you may have just gotten married and your new wife or your new husband has a liability from the past. That's you know their liability, it's not your liability. So we can try to pull the assets out that way. Business assets, if you're in business, sole proprietorship out there, general partnership, um, we try to exempt all your business assets because those are the assets that are used to make money. Um, so those assets can become exempt from what the IRS can collect on because that's what you're using to make the money to pay the IRS on the other side. So we don't want them taking those assets. We don't want to show them, hey, the, we're going to be in compliance and we're going to do this right. And then, you know, what's the encumbrance behind it? Any of the assets, what do you owe on those assets? Uh, just like the house and maybe your furniture, maybe a lot of different things you have out there. And the valuation of your vehicles, what you owe on them versus what they're worth. And then we've got the income and allowable expenses. Uh, we want you as the taxpayer to keep as much of your income as possible to you know, pay for everything you need to do in your life, to live your life and, and keep you free from, from the IRS and keep the greatest possible benefit from the income that you're making. You know, what we're looking for is to reduce what the IRS says you have available to pay them back. So if we're dealing with an OIC, every single dollar that we can pull off of what you've got available, basically will save you $48 in what you're gonna to offer to the IRS to settle. So that's the whole reason we're doing the asset reduction, we're doing income reduction, and finding a lot of different ways. We ask a lot of our clients to, hey, bear with us. We're gonna go some extreme strategies. And if you're willing to work on those extreme strategies, you can save a lot of money with the IRS. Doesn't mean you gotta live that way for a long time. It just means you've gotta work with us until we get that offer accepted. Which may be that year, could be two years, but work with us. And, and if you work with doing this yourself, you can save that same money. And what you're gonna see is that $48 can add up to a heck of a lot of money on savings on your offer and compromise. So, you know, what we're looking at, when we're looking at a lot of these things, we get a lot of clients that come to us and, you know, when we first start out doing this, we've got excess income of, you know, let's say $1,000. So that means the IRS, when they look at it, they have $1,000 they can collect for the next 36 months, 48 months. You can settle for a lot of money. If you owe $50,000 and you have an extra $1,000 coming in, guess what, over the next 50 months, you can pay it all back. But not one of us really has $1,000 left over at the end of the month. Even, even the people we talk to on the phone and we're sitting down and we're going through their uh, quick you know, values and what they're gonna have left over, a lot of times our clients are going, yeah, okay, I got this, and we're going through that, and I'm going, you got $1,000 left. Do you want to pay that to the IRS? No. They really don't once we get into it. But a lot of times when we're dealing with the IRS, they still they have more than $1,000 because of the way the IRS looks at things. So sometimes we will talk to clients and say, hey, your spouse, can, can they move to a part-time job? Lower that income down, $1,500 a month. Or, you know, we get a tax break by doing that, and we save a lot of money over over here on the what's allowed and what the IRS is saying you can pay. Um, so, you know, if you've got the original OIC, the component there, if they were making a thousand dollars extra a month, you could save forty-eight thousand dollars, basically, by doing that. What's your savings if we were to do that? Well, your savings is going to be the forty-eight thousand that we're saving off the OIC less what she would have he or she would be having coming in and we would basically get down to a thirty two thousand dollar net savings on your OIC so it, it's worth doing some of these things 
it's just really hard. So some of the other uh, income reduction techniques is we find a lot of people that are working overtime. So we'll tell them to cease their overtime. Or you may talk to somebody and hey, we can get them down to part time. Uh, we talked about the one spouse, you know, quitting work, change employment to where you're making less money, so we can save some money on on the OIC. And you know, if you're close to retirement, you can always retire because everybody knows Social Security doesn't pay very much. So we, you know, we can settle you there too um, if you're close enough to retirement. Um, the other reduction techniques, if you've already taken loans on your 401k and stuff, get the employer to do a payroll deduction to pay your 401k back. Because if it's a payroll reduction, then it comes right off what you're going to be able to pay to the IRS. Union dues, if you're in a union, um, that $10 a month will save you $480 in your OIC, remember dollar for dollar. Um, disability pay for your disability insurance, uh, you can save money on your OIC as well, because that's a payroll deduction in most cases. And then um, if you're in business and you are self-employed or even running a business out there, you know, there's ways to reduce your gross income and your net income. And you know, you can pay your workers more. You know, everybody would love to be paid minimum $15 an hour minimum wage, right? Um, you can work less. You can spend more through your business, whether it's through um, doing more advertising, um, you know, it's doing more maybe in the community that you can consider marketing expenses, but it's got to be reasonable and customary for your type of business that's out there. Maybe you have worked vehicles that the business owns and do some work on those vehicles. Whatever you can do to spend money to reduce the net income from the business. And then if your Schedule C, the same thing is effectively you're going to reduce the um, what are your net cash flows out of the business. Because they're not necessarily looking at depreciation, but they're going to look at your cash flows. And then any other secured debts that you may have to run your business. So. And then there's other income things, but one of the things that you shouldn't have is a lot of passive income. Okay, that means if you've got a lot of money in the bank and you're earning that great, what is it, quarter of a percent interest out there? Well, the IRS knows that, hey, you've got money and stuff out there, but you shouldn't be earning any interest. There shouldn't be any cash sitting around. Uh, dividends, the same thing. You shouldn't be having any dividends coming in. That means if you have money, that means you got money in stock somewhere as accessible to the IRS. Um, rental income, you know, again, shouldn't be netting a lot from your rental property, but if you happen to be, guess what? You got money to pay the IRS and we've got to reduce those cash flows somehow. That may be fixing up your rental house or doing extra things in the rental house to, you know, make it better, but it reduces the cash flows from the rental house. And then what you're going to be looking at pension and Social Security is, you know, what do you have coming in and, you know, not necessarily reducing it, but showing that you have other expenses. And then the ultimate reduction would be sometimes divorce. You know, I hate to say it, but sometimes that's, that's uh, not something I ever recommend, but it's something that's out there that, that can be used. Um, and one of the reasons is, is alimony or like uh, we use in Texas, it's temporary spousal support, but it's mandated by the court, so it, it comes off. Uh, child support, the same thing. So if one spouse owes a lot of money to the IRS and you go through a divorce whether you want to or not, you could pay a heck of a lot of money in child support and it's deductible and then you settle for very little. So those, those are some of the techniques that you can, you can use out of there. And the thing I'll say about the divorce is a lot of times what you're going to find is that when one spouse is in this much trouble, it's leading there anyway because it's, it's such a problem between the family and the husband and wife that it leads to just so many arguments that it's going that way. So if it's going to go that way, find a way to settle it and settle it in the best interest of the kids and it will help you on the tax side in settling your tax debt.
The other things is royalties. You shouldn't really be having royalties come in. It means you're probably in Texas oil and gas property and you got a lot of royalties coming in. You're gonna pay that to the IRS anyway. Uh, payments on covenants not to compete. So if you had a former business partner or something and you're paying them, you know, those will reduce your income. Uh, annuities and structured settlements, uh, we've kind of got to watch those and, and what the settlements are for and stuff. And basically, once you know that the IRS is coming and they're going to take it, find a way to sell it yourself, settle it, spend it, get rid of it in some fashion. But realize that there's always the statute of limitations and there's a time frame that the IRS is looking for how you settled it, how you sold it, who you sold it to. So if you're going to take a piece of property that you own or royalties that you own and you're going to sell it to a family member at a very, very reduced price, it better be close to the fair market value or as we use the quick sale value to get rid of it. Because that's what the IRS minimum that they're going to be looking for. If you don't do that and you take, let's say, a $200,000 property and you sell it for $10 to a family member, or anybody, IRS come back and invalidate that sale and you've got that $200,000 property that they're gonna take. So uh, just be, be aware of that. And the last thing we said on that screen was lose it in divorce. So if you give it away in divorce, that happens too. Um, now, we've talked about reducing assets. One of the things that we've got out here is um, the IRS, when you're doing the 433s and stuff, are looking at what your allowable expenses are. And they do have limits. And what they're gonna, their limits are is the national standards. And we'll kind of run through this real quick, but you know, their first level of review are gonna be, hey, this is the only thing we're gonna allow is right here is this national standard. So it may not be what you can afford to live on, and we use a, a guideline that if you're making more than $40,000 a year and you're uh, a couple and that's it, anything over $40,000, the IRS is looking for that money to come to them. Because that's basically what the national standards come into. Give or take a few thousand dollars depending on where you live in the country and, and everything else, but it's there. Now you can add to that by having kids. You can add to that by adding other dependents like uh, grandma, grandpa, um, you know, your mother-in-law, uh, grandchildren, you know, whatever the case, but if they become your dependents, they can add to those national standards and, and, and increase, you know, what you're allowed to deduct. Now, what you'll see in this table here is if you had a family of three, and this is Broward County, uh, making $4,000 a month, the national standards, um, are going to be only about um, twelve hundred and forty-nine dollars for um, food and stuff. Uh, Twenty-two sixty-nine for housing, medical, uh, one hundred and eighty. But if you added one more dependent, we can add an additional five hundred and forty-nine dollars. That's to the national standards, and over forty-eight months, this saves you twenty-six thousand three hundred and fifty-two dollars just by adding a dependent. Um, but if you're adding a new kid, trust me, it's going to be a heck of a lot more out of your pocket than the $23,000. <laughs> <laughs> but they're deductible. Um, you know, the maximum allowable housing, uh, what you're going to see, and we, we showed the housing screen out there, um, but a lot of times we can use that second mortgage if you have it on there and we can get some of that deductible. Um, and to make sure we're using the full amount so they don't go back down to actuals. And then anything beyond the standards, what you're going to see is uh, medical. If there's a justification, major problem and stuff, we can get that at, deducted at times. We do have to show that you're paying it, not just letting it accrue with the doctors and the hospitals. You actually got to be paying something to them. And then we can deduct what you're paying. Um, handicapped, any handicapped equipment and anything that's related to our earning income. Transportation, we saw what the, the allowance was for transportation. Um, if we don't have that a full allowance used based on actuals and stuff, sometimes trading in a vehicle to get that payment up. 
Um, use cash if your car's upside down to pay your loan down. So that's a reduction of cash. And uh, and then we've got to be very accurate with you know what the sale values and stuff of the vehicles and stuff are. And then getting beyond those standards again on transportation is what's the medical justification for it? Or very large family, or again related to earnings. So sometimes you may be in the business and you have to have that big truck that's out there. Well, it's related to your earnings, so we can get that deducted. Um, or you've got to have a real, real nice car because you're taking clients out all the time, so we can get that deducted. Um, and then if you have a long day of the commute, then if you're driving far, we can get some things added for that as well. And then um, maximizing your health care, your insurance and medical. We all know we all are required to carry insurance now, and it hasn't gotten any cheaper. So yes, whatever you're paying for your health insurance, that becomes deductible. And it doesn't matter what you're paying, you, you can do that. Um, lower your copay, increases your insurance premiums, and lowers your out-of-pocket later on, but it's deductible. And then maybe carrying a cancer policy or something with, uh, a lot of people see Aflac, if your employer offers Aflac or whatever, supplemental coverage, we can get that, you can get that deducted as well. And then making sure that if you owe uh, any hospitals or doctors, get a payment plan with it and pay it consistently and it becomes deductible in your offering compromise. And remember grandma, help her with her medical expenses because she doesn't have any money to do it and there's nothing else is gonna happen. You can get that deductible as well, as long as you're paying it you know, on a consistent basis. And then, as we saw in the slide, Grandma could buy groceries if, if need be. Um, and then, you know, adjust your withholding, you know, so you can catch up on your taxes so you don't owe more taxes the next year. Um, you're gonna lose your refund if the OIC is accepted and you have money left over every year. They're gonna take that. So work with your accountant, your CPA, your own office and make sure that you're not over withholding, but you also don't want to be under withholding to where you can have money due you can't afford to pay. Because remember that's being in compliance means five years of making sure that you're not going to owe more money at the end of the time, you file your taxes on time, and if you do owe money, you pay it. So if you do change your withholdings, make sure you're going to have enough money to cover your taxes at that time. And also, if you're in a payment plan and you owe money every, each year when you come to your taxes and you break, that breaks your payment plan, you would have to call and reset up a new payment plan. They get tired of doing that. And at some point they go, nope, that ain't gonna work. And I, know that I filed a notice of intent to levy on you. And that notice of intent to levy, I can means I can levy your bank account. And I did that a long time ago. And now there's nothing in your bank account right after you did what? Deposited your payroll check. Because for some reason they hit at the same time your payroll does. So, you know, you gotta be aware of those things as you go through. Now, one of the things that um, the IRS does not do, if you owe money to the state, um, and I know we don't have state income taxes here. You know, there's a lot of states we deal with that uh, have state income tax, but any uh, agreements you have with them, the IRS doesn't care about, and they think that's their money as well, because they're the first. Um, sometimes we try to get some things combined where we can do federal and state installment agreements at the same time. They're hard to get done, but it is a possibility. And then anything that we're dealing with as far as maximizing your expenses that is court ordered is deductible whatever it is so if it's ordered by the court that you pay it and you're paying it it's deductible if you're not paying it generally they're not going to allow it because you may be breaking the law by not making the payment let's say on your child support or temporary support or whatever it may be but you haven't paid it so then they're not going to allow you to be have it deducted so make sure you're paying it as well. 
And then we try very hard to get child independent care deductions out there and accept it, lower your, your payments. So babysitting, daycare, we kind of get creative with it and making sure that you, if you're gonna deduct it, you're gonna put it on your tax return, getting their social security number and all that fun stuff out there, but we're gonna make it deductible. Uh, nursery school, preschool, and adult dependent care. So, you know, be aware of that as well. And then maximizing our insurance for family security required by pre-existing arrangements, whether it's divorce decree, business arrangement, you know, what can we do there? Disability, disability for self-employed persons. A lot of times we get disability for uh, people that are working for companies as well because they're gonna be deducted right off their paycheck. So it's payroll deduction. And then tax fees. So tax representation, tax preparation, that's all deductible for your uh, installment agreements. It's deductible right there for your OICs as well. Whether it's preparation, mid-year review, and that'll, that's basically dollar for dollar. So if you paid uh, $1, it's gonna save you 48 over the life of uh, OIC. So we work with a lot of clients to be able to show them what the cost advantages are. Plus, if you've got a CPA or EA, uh, which is an enrolled agent or tax attorney, all the people that work for us, um, they know that you're serious about getting things resolved and making sure you're preparing your returns right every year. So it's, it's a good thing to use and we can get that deduction for you. And you can as well, just by showing that, hey, you've got them prepared by somebody every year uh, going forward. And then you got other secured debts. This is difficult sometimes to get through to the IRS. And when you're representing yourself and you're going out there, you've got to be able to show that it's going to be for the health and welfare of the family. Um, and it's necessary for the production of income. And, you know, if it's health and welfare, then it's got to go to the medical side and you got to be able to prove it up. And, you know, and then you got the employee owned equipment, you know, if you're like an auto mechanic, buy more tools and then have them secured and pay that every month, you know, as well. And that's just one example of, uh, of things you can do there to maximize your secured debt side. And, you know, as we've talked about before, uh, union, due, union dues, disability, and then, you know, tool purchase, uniforms, teacher supplies, um, you know, depending on what you're doing, licensing fees and professional dues and so forth and so on. Now, some of the other considerations as you're going through the and doing your offering compromise or your uh, payment plans is make sure you're annualizing everything for seasonal fluctuations. There's a lot of businesses that do really good, you know, this time of the year because they're selling for Christmas and stuff. And so you need to annualize what your revenues are throughout the year. Um, and then, you know, also going to be an annual, uh, analyzing what the IRS would receive in bankruptcy. So if you were to go to bankruptcy, you know, what would they receive, you know, there as well. And then if uh, your OIC or installment agreement and, you know, would it be permitted to discharge in bankruptcy if uh, they do it? But remember, if you file for bankruptcy, the clock is running. You only have limited times to do that, so you'd have to check with a, a bankruptcy attorney. Most people haven't filed tax returns recent enough to uh, uh, go to bankruptcy because you have to have them filed for at least three years before it's even applicable to do this in bankruptcy. And then generally pro prohibited. Everybody likes to make char charitable contributions. Those are not prohibited. Those are prohibited, not deductible. Unsecured debt, unless they're work necessary necessity for credit cards. And tuition is not deductible. A lot of kids put their kids in private schools. That is not deductible. Tuition in college is not deductible. Um, voluntary retirement contributions are not deductible. Um, your cable TV is not deductible. 
And then remember the exceptions is health and welfare and then production of income. And some more items that are on here is we talked about the luxury car. That's generally not deductible except if it's appropriate for your profession. And housing in, lo in excess of local standards. Now, we have to consider when we're doing this is what can you sell the house for versus, you know, what do you owe on it? And sometimes it's just not feasible to do it. So you have to fight the IRS to be able to keep the house you're living in and not have to move down to a smaller house if it fits what they call their national standards. So there, there are some special circumstances that you can work through there. Generally, as you're going through and fighting the IRS, you've got to remember a lot of the techniques that we showed here and what we're doing. And you can make this work for you when you're fighting the IRS if you can find the right way to do it. Now, if you do need help, we're always available for help. I do have people that answer my phone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And all you got to do is pick up the phone and call us at 1-888-930. 1016 at any time. You'll get one of our operators at certain times of the year, day. Our tax consultants are usually always available and we'll try to call back as soon as possible. So if you do need help, even if you're trying to do this yourself, we're there to do it. Now if we have any questions, I can I can take some questions here. Yes? What about payroll taxes? Payroll taxes are always the, the fun part of uh, what we do because the small business owners are usually using that cash to float something in their business. Um, payroll taxes, we can generally get them on a payment plan. I've, I've done very well at getting them on a payment plan. As far as settlement goes, the only way you're going to be able to settle your payroll taxes if you have an issue is to actually close the business, let the IRS issue the trust fund penalty against you, and then we go to the IRS and settle with an offer and compromise to get rid of it, but it does require you closing your business to do that. Doesn't mean you can't reopen after we get everything going, but you will have to close that business. And if they think it's a like business while we're in the middle of the OIC, they can reject the OIC and say, hey, you're in a similar business doing the same thing, and now that business is liable for that as well. So that does become a big issue. Um, assets and reorganization, let's say, um, you know, you have a, a big loan to your company and, um, you know, and it's being reorganized and uh, unclear, you know, I mean, how, how that would factor in, let's say, to negotiate, you know, let's say if you have, um, I, like, I, I know, like, if, if you took your pension, and you turn that into ordinary income, and now you have, you know, a whole thing against that. Well, what it's going to depend on is who you owe the debt to. If you're reorganizing for the debt that a company, your company owes you, or owes your retirement account or anything out there, they're going to consider that you and that debt and what they owe all one and the same. Now, if you're going to owe the money to a bank or a third-party lender, that's out there and you're reorganizing what we're going to be able to do or what you're going to be able to do is take and show what the value of your assets are and show that in comparison to what you're going to owe or what you still owe that's out there because most of the time they're going to have that encumbrance on your assets so you're not going to be able to do anything with them anyway and then we'll be able to show that hey it's there to make money or whatever the business asset is and we'll be able to lower the value that the IRS could access if they wanted to. But what if the business owes you? If the business owes you, they're going to consider that as uh, potential income to you. Mm -hmm. And when you're going through and you're doing your um, OIC, which is going to be your 433A, your personal financial statement, you're going to show that your company, XYZ, owes you, let's say, $100,000. And when it comes down to the end, they're going to say you have $100,000 available to pay them. <laughs> So it, it becomes very complicated out there, and then we, then what you need is somebody, that, one of my tax attorneys, that come in here, and they're going to be able to show that hey, you can't access that hundred thousand dollars on these things out here because we have to show that use those to make money, to pay you on the other side. So you can't have it both ways. 
as far as the IRS goes. Hopefully we can get them to convince to leave everything alone so you can make money and, and pay them. In terms of them doing a levy on or the proper term against your home, say that you had a trust in your house, was titled in your own personal trust. Is that something that they could still levy against? Well, that'll be depending on how the lawyer structured your trust and when the trust was established. That's one of the questions you would actually have to call my office and talk to my tax attorney okay. um, because that gets into the more of the legal realm than the tax realm. You know, me being an enrolled agent, you know, I'm expert in tax and what the taxes can do and, and how to solve your tax problem. My tax attorneys are the ones that also have the knowledge behind it on how to untangle the other parts of the law as well. Thank you. New companies that set up in this economy, they have a swing that goes up, swing that goes down, and sometimes you may not have a problem today, and you're going to end up doing the wrong thing and having a problem. So I'm looking at this from the other side. Um, do you offer a plan to keep people to understand this is the way your business should grow, this is our legal advice, this is what we should do to make it prosper so you don't have to have Taxation Solutions come to the rescue? Well, Taxation Solutions, I mean, we're open year-round. We work with, with businesses across the country to work on their tax planning as well as, you know, solving tax problems. So. What we try to do is we can work with, with businesses to do their bookkeeping. We can work with businesses to plan for the future. Um, we've helped businesses work on their cash flow, um, work on return on investment analysis. And so we do do all those services. Um, that's why we have the CPAs and enrolled agents and tax attorneys so that we can offer all that help from beginning to end. So when you form your company till you close your company, you know, we'll, we can be there with you and hold your hand through all of it. Now, the other thing, I, I think we had another question is, is audits and stuff, is if you are involved in an audit, you need a good CPA. Um, I'll be the first to tell you, not necessarily a CPA that did your taxes for you, but uh, a CPA that knows, you know, how to handle the IRS and whether it's an uh, enrolled agent CPA at our office or tax attorney, we know how to handle the IRS agent, no matter where we're at. Um, we're dealing with an audit in Virginia, and I actually don't have anybody sitting in Virginia today. I have a guy in North Carolina that handles it all from his office there. And, um, you know, we deal with correspondence with the IRS agents and, and solve a lot of problems. Um, we had a young lady that called us the other week that uh, actually their CPA didn't show up for the meeting, and the IRS basically said, nothing's deductible. How lovely is that? We've been able to go back and do an audit reconsideration where we've gotten the IRS to go back and relook at the audit, relook at the support that we've got, and get them to reconsider the whole audit, and that's what they're doing for us. So there are techniques that we use for, for everything. Talking about estate tax issues, um, like I uh, recently had a situation that my dad's estate, the state in New Jersey audited, and we had to deal with that for a year and a half. We, we deal with those problems. Um, I have my tax attorneys experts at that, um, and I deal with a lot of states and trust myself, but when it comes to, depending on what the issue is, we would have to look at it, and, and every case is different. Everything that we do is different. As much as everybody says, hey, I've got this tax problem, your case is, is different than this person's. It may have started the same way, that you didn't file your taxes for a long time or something, but when it comes down to it, we've got to look at every case a little bit differently. When we deal with the states and trusts, it's the same thing, and, and state by state, you know, at that as well. Because, you know, in Florida, you're not, not dealing with state taxes but New Jersey, New York, and a lot of other states around, you got the state tax problem. And whether it's dealing with the states and trusts in there, at the, in those states, or even dealing with uh, just your personal taxes there. So we deal with each one of them. We'd have to take a look at that and, and see what we can do for you. Is there a charge for your first phone call for the initial consultation? Absolutely not. We will actually sit down and, and talk to every person that calls us 
and we'll go through what their problem is and we will actually walk through a lot of what we've just done here and you know we'll talk not in terms of what form and and stuff that's here available to you but we'll, we'll find out what you owe you know one to the IRS but everybody has a debt you know whether it's on your home your car credit cards you know health you know insurance medical payments you know name it you, you everybody's got it so we kind of walk through the same thing right there on the phone call and we'll be able to go through and say hey this is what we think we can do there's no promises in this in this industry because you don't necessarily as much as you think you know about your personal situation you leave out I got a hundred thousand dollars in this 401k you know well you could have told us that when we were asking that question but you know there, there are certain things that you don't think about that hey would this be applicable in settling this or you know what do we have here and a lot of times we get people that don't realize that um, you know their home is worth as much as they think you know as much as their home is you know we have clients that all the time they'll call us and tell us our home's worth a hundred thousand dollars or 150 and i owe 125 on it and we get into it and we find out their home is worth a heck of a lot more than that and they actually owe a heck of a lot more on it than they thought too <laughs> so you know we deal with those, all those circumstances but that's the reason we do everything uh, the initial consultation absolutely free is because it, we don't want to charge anybody that we don't know what their situation is going to be mm -hmm. but we want to be able to sit down and look at it you know with them okay. any other questions i thank you all for coming tonight i really appreciate you guys being here and like okay. i said if there's anything we can do for you any way we can be assistance for you you know feel free to pick up the phone and, and call us if we don't have somebody available to talk with you about your problem, we'll get somebody back with you as, as soon as possible. And all you gotta do is call the 1888 number 930-1016. Like I said, anytime, and we'll get somebody with you as soon as possible. Thank you again. That's it. That's the rent.